Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's Spy Master interview series. As part of our one year anniversary, we are looking at the 1998 Avengers film. Uh, and as part of that series, we have two interviews lined up for you. The first one is with none other than the director of the film, Jeremiah Chechik. Yeah, this was really exciting because I remember back in the day reading Cinescape magazine. Um, there was a lot of advanced PR for this movie because it was an adaptation of a cult favorite show. You had major stars. And I remember reading interviews with Chechik back from when I'm a teenager talking about what this movie promised to be. Um, whether it delivered, that's another question altogether. But those memories are still quite strong. But let's not forget, you know, Jeremiah also did you know, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, Benny and June with Johnny Depp. But then 1998, The Avengers. But I won't spoil the story. I'll let him tell you himself. He was very gracious with us, gave us a lot of time and spoke in depth about the film. Cam, roll that clip. And joining us now, the director of this week's film, The Avengers, it is Jeremiah S. Cheshik. Jeremiah, thank you for joining us. Yes, uh, I apologize in advance. <laughs> <laughs> come come now, come now. We, 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 we start off on a nice foot. So I want oh, to hear more. And then you, yeah. then you grind yeah. down, right? <laughs> okay. There has to be an arc to the story, of course. Yeah. You see, yeah. <laughs> okay, there's redemption at the end, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Starts comedy, ends tragedy. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is the same thing, in my view. Sure. <laughs> well as i mentioned just now obviously this week's film is 1998's the avengers um and part of that is basically just talking about how it was made i do want to speak about that film with you but before we get to that i kind of want to know more about your story of becoming a director because i was reading a lot about you today find out that you used to be a fashion photographer which blew my mind because my other my partner is a photographer as well so it's a nice connection there um, so just tell us a little bit about how you went from photography to directing. Well, uh, okay. Um, if I can remember. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you um, for, for not saying uh, the ill-fated Avengers <laughs> or this badly reviewed Avengers. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, but um, I began uh, my career such as it is. Um, as a, a visual artist, um, and uh, so I probably will end as a visual artist, um, you know, etchings, painting, lithography, intaglio printing, and that led me uh, to a lot of experimental image making with uh, photography as it blended with really traditional, maybe 16th, 17th century, uh, printing techniques, early photography, co coding your own, um, whether it's plate stones and, and then eventually early holograms, you know, artistically. I was part of a, uh, a gallery, which um, I had a hand in the beginning called A Space, and that was in Toronto. Uh, I was born in Montreal and uh, I was living in, in Toronto at the time, um, kind of, you know, a, a, a young artist um, and, and it achieved I'm certainly in my world, um, some success in that I was having solo shows, even in my early 20s. Um, I had uh, council grants, which are, you know, like uh, arts grants um, everywhere but the U.S., <laughs> <laughs> right? where countries actually like art and appreciate the value of artists. Um, so that that led me down a path um that was very uh, kind of uh, integrated with some really extraordinary artists. I had the opportunity of meeting Warhol at that time. And, you know, all of that churn around. I worked with uh, General Idea, who are, um, you know, a, a conceptual art base, two of which are now uh, passed away. But um, A.A. Bronson, who's living in Berlin, is very much active in the art scene. So th those are relationships that went back a long way. Um, out of one of my solo shows, uh, there was a, uh, a man um, who turns out he was, he was a, a big uh, 
big hoop de doo at McCann Erickson. And uh, the, the show is very well uh, reviewed. And he came and he bought a print. And um, uh, a few days later, he had asked me if I would be interested in shooting um, an ad for the agency. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I said, well, what's it pay, <laughs> right? First question out of any artist's mouth, <laughs> what am I getting it's, paid for? It's a smart um, question. It's a smart question. <laughs> Anyway, it, it was more than I had made the whole previous year for one photo. So I thought, well, that's okay. I'll do that. Uh, and I was living in a, you know, a, a kind of a rough and tumble uh, garret loft where I was, I was quite happy working. And um, I did, I think it was for wine or something like that. But, but I did the fo photos. I, you know, I was working with large format cameras at that time. Um, and uh, I, I d did that and it was, you know, they were thrilled with it. And I was thrilled because like, well, this is easy. This is an easy way to make money. What art. <laughs> <Right? Yeah. laughs> um, but obviously I kept on doing my kind of art practice as I've continued up to this day. In fact, um, I've just minted my first NFTs, but more on that later. Anyway, um, so out of that one day, uh, this is a few months later, I got a call from him and he said, like, you know, I have an assistant at the agency is doing a freelance job for a fashion house in Italy. Uh, and he was looking for a inexpensive photographer. Right? <laughs> That's me, I said. Um, and uh, so he put me in touch with him. I the concept was recreate the images of uh, Harrell, George Harrell, who is a very well-known classic fashion photographer, very dramatic lighting, very almost the equivalent of say noir lighting in film, but really beautiful, very evocative, black and white. And so I didn't really know much about, about that. So I started to kind of immerse myself in, in Harrell's work and, and associated photographers. And um, I went out and I uh, rented a, the right camera so I'd at least look cool. And, and I, um, I was working in my, my loft. And, and then one day I descended on the loft like four like supermodels and makeup and the whole deal. And I were, you know, I had, been smart enough to get lights so I lit them very dramatically and they were they were great and I shot the pictures my deal with them was interesting they were paying me very very little for these because they were more editorially mm -hmm. but also used for advertising and I said listen you, you know I'll, I'll I'll do it for the gig also as a fun gig you know just to explore but I want to credit on every one of those images. So anytime you run it, you have to credit me. Uh, I didn't really think about it until like four or five months later when I was walking on the street and a bus just drove by and there was an image of mine, huge, hmm. of course, with my credit. And then I, I, this is no exaggeration. And I looked up and there was a huge billboard on top of the building with another image that I did. So they had just launched it everywhere, back of magazines. And overnight, I was like a very famous fashion photographer. <laughs> My phone started to ring and uh, I was like, whoa, okay, this is, I, I, I've fallen in the gold here. Um, so I decided that I was going to put together a book because as a fashion photographer, one needed a book. Hmm. But now I had credibility. So because I had credibility, it's like, well, what have you done? Oh, I've done that. You know, you can see it anywhere. People, oh, yeah, great. So uh, come on, come on, models, makeup artists, whatnot. And I started to explore, you know, good, interesting, experimental visuals, but using models makeup fashion you know got designers and i and i made a book i mean you know a, a, a sample book and mm -hmm. um started to kind of work and one of the uh early gigs that i got was 
for it was uh, Neiman Marcus, one of those, who sent me to Milan uh, to shoot for to shoot a series of pictures for a, a designer who was doing his very last collection for a fashion house called Complice, and his name was Gianni Versace. And another one who was very famous in Italy, hadn't really done the Miami Vice thing yet, and that was Giorgio Armani. So I went and I shot for both of them. They were so kind to me. They were, they were just, you know, they gave me their studios, which were beautiful in Milan. Uh, and I, I, so I, I did the shoot. And as I was kind of prepping it, they, they basically said, you know, uh, speak to... Uh, Ricardo Guy agency. So, you know, I went to the agents and I said, listen, uh, here's my book, such as it is. It was all basically test photos and a few ads. And uh, they loved it. They thought this is great. And they said, oh, do you know, what's her name? Lucia Raffelli. Uh, she's at Vogue. And I was like, no, sorry, I don't know her. Uh, so they said, oh, you should, you should meet her while you're here in Milan. So they set up a meeting with her and me. Off I went to, I was thrilled just to like walk in their offices and look around. I thought this would be really cool. Just, wow, this is Vogue. This is Italian Vogue, which is the ultimate at that time for me. Went there, sat with her. She just looked through my book like leaf, 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 leaf. And I was, that was it for me. I was ready to go uh, back to uh, the hotel and you know return home a few days later. And she said, so uh, when would you like to start? <laughs> this is a good meeting. This, no, this is, a is like, meeting. what? Yeah. You know, I, like I'm in my, my 20s, early 20s, and, and <clears throat> you know, this is a very traditional thing. And, and so <clears throat> obviously off I went. Um, you know, uh, I made, you know, they, they, I said, I, I'll deliver the pictures that I'm commissioned for now. I'll wrap things up. I'll be back in three months. And uh, in three months I was there, had my own studio and, uh, I was shooting for Vogue and that's how I became a Vogue photographer and worked there for a long time. And then moved to New York, uh, to basically make some money, capitalize on that. And then I started directing commercials. So that, that's the long winded way of saying, I was in the right place at the right time with the right people. So you do some commercials, you do a couple music videos, and then your first movie is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. Now, this is really interesting, going from experimental art into the third entry into a franchise, and it works out <laughs> very well for you. I mean, it's a perennial favorite now. It's rewatched constantly every year. I know. I, I, I'm just curious how thought. you got your foot in the door for that film in particular, and sort of what you were looking to do with that franchise. I'm just even also curious if the studio was looking at it as a, you know, a film they were that concerned with versus a, it's the third one, it'll be fine sort of thing. Well, well, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to suggest a topic for another, uh, um, another podcast with another director on a film called Oh Lucky Man. Oh, <laughs> which, okay. <laughs> which yeah. is Malcolm Mc, McDowell, perennial favorite of mine. Anyway, uh, how did that happen? Well, I had been working in commercials uh, in New York and elsewhere for a while. And, and I had really made a name for myself in commercials. I had done some uh, kind of, you know, what I would consider big national commercials that, that were running. You know, The Night Belongs to Michelob. Uh, these are things, you know, Tonight, 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 you know, like big uh, Nike Revolution, uh, you know, stuff that was when uh, commercials were really uh, at, le at least adjacent to the cultural realities. I mean, not like now where there's so, so much lateral stuff there. You know, if you were watching TV, you saw it. And so um, that, that was a, you know, I didn't just pop into features. I had been working kind of uh, quite seriously on uh, on my commercials and, and doing that. And, you know, when I was at university, I had studied um, directing and, uh, you know, theater production. So I, I was very immersed in what it takes to get performances from actors. I knew that though I hadn't really done anything from university and I obviously knew about lighting. 
um, when I was young, I, I mean, I did, I was, I trained as a classical musician so I could read and write music. And, and so, I, you know, I had a kind of a, um, you know, master of none, but I knew enough to be dangerous and a lot of little skills. And so, um, but at some point um, I had done a big campaign for, fuck, what was it? Anyway, I forget, but I had packed my bags from New York. I was kind of pissed at New York at that time and moved to LA because I was working here a lot. No sooner that I kind of like plunked down got my shit together here that I got another gig uh, called um, I Love New York. <laughs> so I did the, that campaign, <laughs> flew back to New oh. York to do I Love New York. And um, so I did that. Uh, and uh, not that long after returning home, the phone rang and uh, please hold for Steven Spielberg. <laughs> And it was like, yeah, right, joke. Uh, anyway, the, he got on the phone. He said, basically, every time I ask who did this commercial, uh, I like that commercial, your name comes up. So I thought maybe you should come in here and meet me and Kathy Kennedy and Frank Marshall and just see, maybe you want to do a movie. Who, me? <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, went to Universal, met with Stephen. It was really, really delightful. And uh, when I left the office, I had a deal there and uh, an office at Amblin, <laughs> same kind of weird shit. And I was to do my first movie, which was Amateur Night at the Apollo, back in okay. New York, the Apollo Theater, before mm -hmm. it became televisual. It was yeah. really the history of all of that stuff that happened at the Apollo. You know, now a white guy I'm not going to get that gig mm. right? for sure. But, but then uh, no one was the wiser. And um, so I developed this and I developed it uh, at Amblin with Warner's. And my goal was to make a very small movie at Warner's, like under 5 million, which in indie film today, 5 million is great. But then for a studio, 5 million is a rounding error. You know, that's the cost of lunch on a big movie. So, I, but I wanted to do it because I didn't want any interference. And they, they agreed and we kind of worked and I got to know um, all the executives at Warner's. And, you know, I was working with these brilliant women, Lucy Fisher, Amy. I mean, you know, I can go on a, a big rant and list, but all of them ended up running studios. I mean, it was mm -hmm. just a delight and developed this thing. It was kind of half real, half fiction. I got the most amazing through Stephen, you know, Alan Davio is my cameraman and blah, blah, blah. And subsequently I'd work with Alan a lot on commercials as well. But um, at the end of the day, turned it in. And, and I remember Terry Semmel, bless him, at uh, Warner said, why are we making this for 5 million bucks? Let's make a big star driven movie for like 40 million. And he said, Jeremiah, you know, Whitney Houston, you did that Coke commercial, diet Coke commercial with her. And, you know, we can bring in Eddie and we can bring, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, but I said, no, it's about unknowns. You don't know if they're going to make it. I mean, who's going to believe dramatically that Whitney Houston isn't going to go on stage and blow everybody away. In reality, at the Apollo, you could be amazing. But if you didn't connect with the audience, they boo you off stage. Conversely, you could be terrible, but made a connection with the audience and they would celebrate you. So um, such was the drama of the movie. You didn't really know what was going to happen. So I said, I don't think this is going to work with the piece that I have. And... Um, you know, I said, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, and uh, <laughs> stupid as that sounded, <laughs> went back to making commercials and they started to send me material, I thought, to let me down easy. I, you know, I said, well, I came close, but and they had sent me script after script and I, I didn't care for many. Um, you know, I didn't realize like, wow, they're offering me real movies at a real studio. Um, you know, like, for example, they, they, they sent me something and said, no, oh, Clint Eastwood, he's, he's going to do this. He's in. Do you want to direct it? And I said, you know, I read the script and I said, guys, please, 
there's no way Clint Eastwood is ever going to do a movie called Pink Cadillac. I mean, Ooh. it's just not going to happen. Right. So right. there you go. What I know, right? <laughs> they sent me their, their um, slate, as it were. And the one thing, the one script that I just thought was amazing. It was so funny and so crazy. And I'd never done comedy, didn't know shit about doing comedy. Um, but it was written by John Hughes, who was the producer. Mm-hmm. It was starring Chevy Chase, who I, I don't go to a Chevy Chase movie. That wasn't my, my idea. Um, and, but I loved it. I thought it was just such a script. So I said, I like this one. Well, all of a sudden, uh, I'm in a meeting with, you know, with John and the studio and Chevy, and they all seem to want me. Uh, I think that uh, Chris Columbus got dinged. They were considering him and Chevy hated him. So I I, I think I I don't really know. But, you know, somewhere I I read that he had gotten the job and walked away, but that wasn't really true. Um, But so I, I basically said I'd do it. And I got on really well with John Hughes, which was something because Mm -hmm. he was very famous for being a difficult guy. I loved him. And I I learned so much about comedy from him Mm -hmm. and and also how to deal with the studios in a politic way, which is a skill that you really need to understand if you're going to have any longevity uh, in the business. Um, And I. I say this having spoken to the head of casting today at NBC Universal on a show that I'm producing. So <laughs> I, it never changes. You know, the, 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 the politics of studio work is, is as important in many ways as, as the work itself, and not on screen, but certainly in keeping, keeping hope alive. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so that, that's, that's how I got that gig. And uh, I tried to hire actors that I liked. I didn't, I didn't watch the first movie. And I didn't watch the second movie. And I've never watched them. I, wow. wanted, I, I wanted to make my own movie. I wanted it to be as original as I could make it, even though it was the third in the franchise. I thought, you know, Warners basically were comfortable with it because it was third in the franchise. The second one had done terrible. First one had done amazing. And, you know, they they knew that if they parked it at Christmas, they wouldn't lose any money on it. So that was that was the deal. And it's interesting just because of the fact that that movie now, I think a lot of people don't connect it to the other films. I think it stands on its own for for many that, that is 100% true, and it's true for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, I set out to make a classic movie. I, I set out to make a timeless movie. You know, you always say that, right? Like, I hope in 50 years people are still watching my film. But um, I, I just don't, you know, you never know what causes that. I try to be clever about my aesthetic choices, you know, with wardrobe, Um I mean, Beverly's hair is not much I could kind of take back on that, but everyone else's hair is pretty well <laughs> works for over the decades. Um, and, and my choice of casting and, and just the classicism of Courier and Ives or, or, or Norman Rockwell, I took that to heart. We built a house on the back lot. And um, so I, I just tried to make the, the you know, the sound, classic the score classic and tell an old-fashioned story and this was surprisingly difficult for for me because i was so used to being aggressively visual like look at me i'm so clever look Hmm. at my composition you can only see one eye it's out of focus isn't that great no i tried to stay out of the way and present the material in the way that it would be best viewed i've learned that as a director that you serve the material right and so i serve the material and cut it and uh, outside of a couple of funny stories from the um preview process about the cat um you know where <laughs> the studio really wanted me to cut that and really? uh, yeah and uh, in fact, the sound of the cat being fried is is me in ADR going, 
<laughs> That's I did that in the looping. But, um, you know, we just kind of left it for the previews. Turned out on the second preview, who is people's favorite scene? So there you go. It's in. Uh, and, and John uh, Blessem gave me pretty much a final cut over the movie. I mean, I didn't really have any interference. In fact, I made a very uh, significant cut um, at the end when I was in the final mix, which is something you rarely do. I made the sound edit. Angelo Badalamente, he did the score. And it was like, you know, a, an off choice, right? Oh, yeah. he did Twin Peaks. I definitely want him for Christmas vacation. So, uh, you know, I try to make smart choices, interesting choices, choices that I'd be proud of. I put it out there and uh, honestly, I, I had no expectations at all. And, um, you know, it's like Sullivan's Travels, like that movie. I, I, mm -hmm. I didn't really respect or really care that much about these kind of broad comedies. I certainly do now, but I didn't have appreciation for them. I was too snobby. Um, but over the years, I have grown so proud of the effect of that movie on people all over the world. And so I hold that film very dear to my heart. Yeah, it's one that I very much enjoyed myself. It's interesting because I actually watched it for the first time ever today. Wow. And, and I, I, I have to say, credit to you, I found it as a hilarious film and I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I've seen a lot of Chevy Chase in my life, mostly his later work with stuff like Community, the TV show. But he's hilarious and it's, it's a great film and you're laughing all the way through. So credit to you for your first film after basically working in photography and then you know, adverts, which are quick 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 second ads to make a full length film that is part of a franchise that still holds up now. Credit, credit to you. Yeah. How the mighty have fallen. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and on to the Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Screen wipe. Ah! <laughs> uh, you know, like, no, the Avengers was, um, it was such, it was, it was, how, how can I describe this? It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Uh, the, the scripting with Don McPherson uh, in London was fantastic. Uh, we had such a great time. We spent a lot of time with Patrick McNee and Diana Rigg. I wanted to make sure that they really loved the script as much as I did. And they were both so great. In fact, Patrick played the blind man in that movie, you know, so he was mm -hmm. on set a lot. And I, oh, so fun. Um, it, it was one of those, those films that I was so excited to make because I was convinced that you could make a really interesting art movie for a studio. Right. Go figure. Learn better now. But, but, um, when when we kind of went to start casting it, also I was basically I, I knew Rafe very well. Uh, we had always wanted to work together, and so I called him and I said, you know, I, I know this isn't kind of uh, you know Onyegin or like some kind of Russian dark piece. It's the Avengers. You'd be like the guy. He said, oh, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> Comedy. Who wouldn't think of Rafe for comedy? Of course. And he's he's so gifted. He's so great. Well, Uma was a different story because originally, you know, it was meant. Um, I don't know if I should really be talking about this. I guess it's just everybody really, really knows. But you know, Uma wasn't my first choice, and and uh, but the studio is very hot on her. She's like so great. You know, I, I love her to death. She's, she's so great. I didn't think the chemistry was so great between them, mm -hmm. uh, but I thought it was good enough. Um, you know, Sean, I, I just sent the script to Sean against the studio's wishes. They said, we're never going to make a deal with him. He's too expensive. I said, then you can pass. I just... I want him for my villain. They said, this, it's greenlit. You're making the movie. We don't need Sean Connery. I said, eh. Lo and behold, phone rings two weeks later. Oh, Sean here. Oh, just Jeremiah. Uh, whoa, <laughs> that voice. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I flew to Malaga 
where he had a house or has a house or his wife has a house, Michelle, and spent the weekend there uh, basically confronting him about all of his requests. Well, don't you think? No, don't you? Shouldn't we? No, because I, I really did want to set the tone for the movie on the right foot. I did not want to suck up to him. I didn't want to be kind of antagonistic. I said, I, you know, each time he had a suggestion, I'd say, no, this won't work because of X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. I wanted him very much to knew, know that I was the director here. And if he didn't want to do it, that's fine. Um, and we were walking up the driveway. I remember, I didn't know if he wanted to do it or not. And just before I got in the car, I said, listen, Sean, this is just him and me talking. Um, you know, if you're going to do this movie now, you, you know it in your head. If you think I'm a jerk, I'm an ass, you're not going to do it. Warners will make the deal. They've never not made a deal with a movie star. So I know they're going to do it. Uh, are you in or are you out? Because if you're out, just tell me now, because on, on uh, Saturday, I've got to make another offer to Michael Caine. Oh, interesting. Wow. Okay. <laughs> wow. And he was all, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got Sean. And, and again, Sean was fucking great to work with. I know a lot of directors, you know, they had their issues with him. He's tough, blah, blah, blah. I, every day was a joy for me on set with him and Rafe too. Oh, we had so much fun shooting that movie. The, the, the dailies are really dazzling. I put together, I thought, a really, really great team. Team that went on to make Harry Potter and the rest of that. But it was, a, it was very, very, uh, it was fabulous. Now, when I was shooting the movie, there was a lot of roiling in the palace here in Hollywood, hmm. uh, a lot of politics, a lot of intrigue. So there was a lot of palace intrigue. And, you know, my, my guys were Terry and Bob who were running the studio at that time. That was my direct connection because I had worked there. I had made several movies there. I had a deal there. Uh, and uh, the two executives who were um, in charge of the movie or one of them, uh, became the head of the of production, both of them, co-heads of production. One of them did not want to make my movie ever. He, mm -hmm. he thought, this is not, I don't want to do this. I don't get it. He wasn't an Avengers fan, didn't really know it. The other one was an Avengers fan, said, this is going to be really good. My producer, Jerry Weintraub, big heavyweight, 900,000 pound gorilla, who I became like, super close and friends too. I miss him every day. Uh, Susie Eakins, his girl and Go Friday and a fabulous producer in her own right. Um, anyway, we had a really, really extraordinary, you know, a situation going on in London, but we didn't have, I didn't really know what was going on here to the effect that I had Two, head, two heads of the studio, one of which did not want to do my movie to begin with. By the time I had finished shooting, my only ally at the studio had, had been fired and left. And the head of the studio now was someone who never wanted to make the movie. Right. And, you know, I can't blame them, you know, at all. I mean, they didn't want to make it. And it would have been rather embarrassing for them to have a major success of it. And uh, so they, you know, they, uh, they put the knives in and they did it kind of passively. I mean, they made me change the score. The original Michael Kamen mm -hmm. score was very dark because mm -hmm. I wanted everything to have this kind of overwhelming brooding sense of something really i know we're kind of living in living in this light frothy neo unrequited romance i know things are very um genteel but there's a force coming and that force is reflected in the inner life of the sound of the music they made me hit all the tones kind of right on you know what i mean and obviously um they made me cut out like 20 minutes of the, of the movie, which is in itself an absurdist movie. There are a lot like the, you know, those, those teddy bears. There's a lot more of mm -hmm. them. And in other words, there were, there was logic 
within the absurdity of the movie that kind of committed to its own reality. Mm-hmm. All of that is gone. Right. So, um, and then they wanted to test it in front of basically a, a I'm, I'm saying, you know, it was Phoenix, a working class Phoenix, mainly Latino uh, audience who really didn't have any idea of what they were watching. And, you know, the cards come back to English, didn't really get it. And so I knew I was hopelessly fucked and there's nothing you can do about it. I mean, you can't really do anything about it. Just wait for the um, inevitable car crash that is coming your way. And so, you know, in there is a really, I think a really, really fabulous movie that I wanted to make that, that did get made, but it never got shown. Um, There's a movement afoot to try and save the Cheche cut, but I don't, I don't control any of that. It's all Warner's. Um, God knows it'd be fun to put it together, but you know, uh, it, it broke my heart. It really, really crushed me, uh, emotionally for a long time. I couldn't direct. I couldn't, I I just couldn't face it. And, uh, out of that, um, I couldn't even look at it. I mean, it was, you know, if I look at it without the sound, I kind of like, you know, I go, wow, that's pretty nice. But, but, uh, but it, it upsets me. Um, though I, I know a lot of people around me still really like it. They really can see beyond it. They, they see the energy and the focus that was there behind the, the kind of manipulation of it or the awkwardness of it. Um, I'm glad for them. It's very personal for me. Uh, it was the only movie that got heavily interfered with, which is saying something, um, you know, not like, you know, I have no one to blame but myself because I didn't really see it coming. I didn't really understand. I was too far away from the studio. So I, I couldn't address anything as I was going. Um, and I didn't have enough power to really kind of, you know, at least force my cut into the market so that it could fail on its own terms, which would be fine with me. I've had successes and I've had failures commercially. Mm-hmm. I've had great reviews and poor reviews. That doesn't matter as long as it's uh, a reflection of what I intended to do. This one uh, does not reveal the intention in its fullest. You know, you can see snippets of it as you go through the movie, but even the whole opening of the movie is cut out. So you're just starting in a very strange way. So, you know, my, my, you know, my personal association with it was was painful uh, at the end and just joyful at the beginning, and uh, and and so, but it did lead me uh, into a whole different way of thinking about film. So in that way, the failure of it, on every level, critically, marketplace, and whatnot, which should have destroyed a less tough man, <laughs> uh, brought out of me a obsession with doing. The first thing I did after several years was a very small film that I shot in 21 days for FX uh, called Meltdown, which was about a nuclear uh, disaster and and, or near disaster. And it was one of the most fun things I ever did. I operated one of the cameras. Uh, I shot it in like, I just blew through it. I did consciously not make any... Um, storyboards. I didn't make shot lists. I shot it totally from the gut and I I never had a better experience. And that led to an entire kind of body of work in television, which I'm still active. So I have a question. The the thing about the Avengers is, and I I rewatched it last night, it's unapologetically weird. And it (laughs) it, it really is like, it's, it's, you could say it's very geeky and you were making this movie at a time where studios didn't get geeky stuff they didn't know what it was you know you look at superhero movies of the era by and large they're like how do we change this to make it palatable to an audience because no audience could ever understand that whereas now you show them an avengers movie with 47 superheroes they're like yeah sure no no problem like would the avengers have been something and you may have had copyright issues with a title nowadays if it was made i'm not really sure but was it something that was maybe too early to be adapting i think so i mean if i would have made that today in a six part TV thing, uh, you know, you would call it, uh, um, you know, what's Jack Schaefer's show uh, for Marvel? Um, 
I'm blanking. You know, the the Marvel TV show, really weird sitcom-y. Uh, One Division. One Division. Oh, I right. mean, it, yeah. it would be in that school, right? I mean, that mm-hmm. that's where it would live. And people would say, oh, it's genius. It's brilliant. Uh, because they're... You know, shows now don't require a four quadrant audience that did. So if you're working on a one or one and a half quadrant movie where you can get a few million people to tune in, that would be astounding in TV. One million people watching it, you'd be a superhero yourself. So, um, yeah, it was it was ahead of its time for sure. Um, but, you know, again, what can you do? I mean, there's, yeah. You can't really... You can't really move back and forth in history, that's for sure. So uh, you know, you do what you do. Um, it, it didn't. It didn't kind of crush my dreams of making weird shows. That's for sure. Well, I, 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 in terms of the questions I had about the film, we we kind of went through a lot of them just then. But one I had left over was: Were you a fan of the Avengers TV show? Big. Okay. Yeah, big um, fan. The Prisoner and 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 you know. And, and, and the Avengers, I uh, guess. Because obviously your first major film was a part of a franchise in itself, being National Lampoon. Hmm. Was there a... Because I suppose we didn't talk about how this film came to you oh, originally. So how, how, did that, how did that come across your desk and how did, how did you decide to take it on? Because you've done a franchise in a sense before, but this is the first adaptation to the big screen. So it's a, it's a lot of responsibility. Well, I had a deal at Warner. So did obviously Jerry Weintraub. I don't know how I I came up with it. Um, this is what I hear. This is going back, and I, I, you know, where I don't know how it came to me through the agency. I was at CAA, and I, I'm not sure how they fought for me or not. But and I think Fincher was somehow um, not attached, but considered and he was like i'm gonna do this in black and white i'm gonna set it you know like blah 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 and jerry weinger was like no (laughs) No, um, so i mean i think he would have done a great job of it but that's just me because he's known for comedy (laughs) i I worship him hilarious guy yeah but he's brilliant he He could do anything you know he's, he's really really fantastic um but anyway, so it was sent to me. I read the script. I knew the Avengers. I came in, I met with Jerry, and I just laid out my vision of the movie, and they gave it to me. And that was as simple as it could be. It, there was no song and dance about it. It was just straight up. They knew me at the studio very well. I had gotten to know Jerry somewhat. Uh, as, as the days went on, um, met Don McPherson, the writer, Brett, really kooky, fabulous. We got on, and so we started to undertake the the writing. He had written uh, the first draft of it, and I remember getting to the teddy bear scene, and as soon as I read that, I was like, I'm in. I don't care what happens. And one of my great memories of pre-production was being in wardrobe, uh, you know, at the tailors who were making these bear suits, and I was doing a, a fitting with Sean Connery, right? And I, I have Polaroid somewhere of Sean in this bear costume with the, the head off. <laughs> and it's like, you can't, can't make image images like that up. I mean, that is really something. So, I mean, there were all those little moments of it that I just, you know, I, I, I think of it fondly, you know, in that way. I was when I was watching it again today. I saw it in the cinema at the time when it came out, but um, I've forgotten that Sean was in the the bunny the bear suit and Eddie that, Izzard. Yes, well, yeah. Again, and, uh, Sean, musician, Sean Ryder. Sean Ryder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, tell me, what director would have put Sean Ryder in a movie? Me. <laughs> I, well, I think Cam said it just then, but it's unapologetic, this film, yeah. in its sense. Yeah. It, it, it leans into it. And, and you've also yeah. got like, turns from a very young Keely Hawes, who's, who's gone to do... Keely, well, work. yeah. Ke- uh, yeah. Keely, by the way, Keely auditioned, and I was like, she's in. She, I remember the days of working with Keely, that's on that striped set, mm-hmm. uh, with her and Rafe, and thinking, wow, she's got chops. She's so good. She's so charismatic. I wish her all the best. I think, you know, she has the possibility of 
doing more work. And boy, she's done fabulously well. I, you know, uh, so that was fun. Eddie Izzard, how I cast him was even funnier. I mean, I was, we were living at the Dorchester <laughs> in style for months, if you can believe it. Um, and uh, TV was on as usual, sound off, MTV on at that time. We're working on the script. I glance up and there's an interviewer sitting with Eddie Izzard who I didn't know from a hole in the head being an American or Canadian American. And I looked at him and I looked at, at, at Don and I said, who is that? That guy, the look of Eddie, how he looked, he should be Sean's assistant. He had one line, one word in the whole movie, shit. Yeah. <laughs> so, yep. So uh, I phoned Susie Figgis, who's the casting agent. And I said, Susie, could you bring in his name again? <laughs> right you know eddie izzard tomorrow uh or the next day for a meeting and she went oh that's genius you're a genius no genius you know but uh so eddie came in sat down uh, he i don't think he's made a movie right and i yeah. said so you know what do you do oh you know i have this stand-up thing and you know i kind of improv a lot sounds great you're in. You're Sean Connery's He's assistant. He's excited. I'm excited. Over the course of five months of making that movie, we become pretty close, Eddie and I, right? Because, you know, you go out for dinner and you, I'll tell you a very funny story of him, me and Sean at the pub. But with Eddie, um, well, actually, I'll preface uh, the second story with the first story. We go out to lunch. Mm -hmm. We're at a small pub near Pinewood just the three of us slipped out of the studio for an hour, hour and a half. And we're there, we're having lunch. It's just me. Eddie, and we're sitting at this table. And one of these guys looks like, you know, an old cabbie comes with his approaching the table a little gingerly. And you could just see Sean is like, here it comes. <laughs> going to get an autograph. At, you know, it's like, we're all very, Oh, hi. Eddie, we can, and, and he looks at Sean Connery and then he goes to Eddie can I have your autograph? Yes. <laughs> I look at Sean. Sean looks at me and we're like, whoa. You know, because I remember I had never seen anything of Eddie at this point. Mm. I knew he was hilariously funny and he was always doing his shtick with me, you know, fake French, fake German, mm -hmm. uh, ma making shit up. But the show wraps. Eddie says, listen, I'm, I'm performing and I'd love you to see what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Then we'll go after, we'll hang out, you know, blah, blah, blah. Great, great. Where are you, where are you playing? He goes, it's the Hammersmith ball, Ballroom. Now, <laughs> I'm living in Chelsea. So I said, oh, yeah, okay. I, I'm thinking there must be like a little theater at the Hammersmith, you know, the 300 theater or something. So I'm with my, my wife. We pull up in a taxi and I'll just never forget this. Eddie Izzard on the mm. marquee, 10 nights sold out. Wow. I, I'm literally gobsmacked, as you guys would say. <laughs> we go in. Of course, we have great seats. I see Eddie for the first time in the Hammersmith Ballroom in front of, what, three, four, five thousand people. I don't know how many people it fits, but it's big. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm literally stunned at his genius. Like, fuck the movie performance. This is like, wow. And, um, of course, afterwards, you know, I'm going, Eddie, why didn't you tell me you were a comedian? Anyway. Um, yeah. And then later when he came to L.A. and he did his first HBO film filming, you know, I was there. And, you know, so, yeah, I, have, I haven't seen him for I don't know how long since he started running marathons daily. Uh, hmm. But but um, I, you know, he he's again broke the mold. Just fabulous. And Sean Ryder was very, very uh, hot commodity in London at that time. You know, they, they were and wanted to wanted to be in the movies. So, you know, great. Um, no, we had fun with casting. You know, Eileen Atkins, uh, Jim Broadbent and on and on and on. I got to work with genius actors. And so I apologize to them. <laughs> Now, I had a question about um, an element of adapting the show into a movie. And I think, you know, the visuals is kind of the showy stuff that I think a lot of people would think, well, that must have been the most difficult part. But one thing I think is maybe more interesting, at least for me, 
is that when you are taking a long running show, so much of the, what grabs people about it is the relationship between the characters. And now you are basically, you know, essentially rebooting these characters in a new form for a mainstream audience. How do you take a relationship that's so well established on the show and manage to get it across in, you know, a two hour film? Well, it's a, it's a great question. And, but, but it, it also uses, I mean, that this film and many, many others use very um, well-established romantic comedy tropes. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the, I guess from the thirties on, whether it's Sturges or, you know, Billy Wilder or whatnot of, you know, the ships passing in the night, the two people who love each other can't really say. So it, it's all of those things, but they're dressed up in this kind of heightened reality, heightened characterizations. But at its root, you just know that these are two people who are in many ways deeply in love, like a schoolyard romance where they, you know, look, but don't touch. You know, we can't go see, we don't want to break the, the, the fragility of it. So I try to create a fragility and, and an ethos about false respectability or whatnot, the, you know, the, the, the likes of which you could never drop the bowler hat, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, the French title is, uh, you know, uh, bowler and high heels and a bowler, right? Something like that. Um, right. Chapeau melon et but de queer, right? Uh, so uh, leather boots and bowler hat. That, that's the French title. And that, that really is, is about it. I mean, it's kind of, you know, cool hat and Louboutins now. You could do the same kind of romantic misses or, or kind of tension. Right. And I think that tension was what was... In, in some ways it was it was missing i mean i'll say you know nicole kidman was going to play it but mm -hmm. she was on spielberg's on, on um kubrick's movie eyes wide yeah. shut mm -hmm. i couldn't get an end date from him and i actually asked the studio to push but they didn't want to and so that's how she had to drop out and 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 we had uh done some rehearsing her and Ray for me and i knew her from a long time ago i made commercials with her in australia when she was teenager so you know the the idea of 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 uma and the part uma brought a whole other kind of real sexiness you know this you know animalistic thing that i just i i loved it i thought you know her approach um to the character was really really strong really great and and sort of won me over and um you know that's the the thing that happens and you know you just learn uh, to roll with it, but you know, again, uh, the the romance of it, or the neo romance of it, is something that I didn't invent. I mean, it's been with us in storytelling forever. So it wasn't. I didn't find that to be challenging as much as I found it to be invigorating when I was directing the actors and really fine tuning that. Because the one thing about those actors and my budget is, I had the opportunity to really tune it and make those scenes work the way I wanted them to work. Um, you know, they weren't flat footed in my view. I mean, maybe right. the movie was, but, but the scenes were not. Right. Well, if we're talking about the, the afterlife of the film now, sort of with a, with, in retrospect, what this episode is releasing on, I believe the 23rd anniversary of the film mm. and it's in its release. Um, and so, Obviously, Warner Brothers has shown they are up for doing director's cuts recently with uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League. Mm. And obviously, this cut exists uh, of your version of the film. Somewhere. Uh, somewhere. I, I have to think, surely it could happen. Here's the problem. A, it costs a lot to do that. Mm -hmm. Zack is making a movie of a franchise that has a built-in audience that are going to see anything with it like people will see whatever those marvel characters you know whether whether it's at the bottom of their audience in terms of numbers or at the top but there it's built in so that there's no risk you know i'm sure their thinking is well who the fuck cares about jeremiah chechik's avengers and and 
I know. I, there are a lot of people online that, that keep coming after me. I'd do it. I don't know how to do it. Uh, and who knows what Warner Brothers is today? You know, you know, you read the news today. AT and T is divesting, and mm -hmm. you know, so by the time this comes out, that'll be kind of a done deal. Um, but who even knows who's in charge of that studio, and how that studio functions, and how they make their decisions, and all the rest of it? So we're a long way from the from the the kind of understanding the decision making of what goes into these things and not and the cost and the risk rewards i, I still got to think we're in this uh in this season of, of, of content is the magic word now mm -hmm. and all these platforms hbo max they they're screaming out for content and if there's this film there that's mostly done there, there's got to be an argument to be made that let's just finish it there is and it would come from the fans certainly mm. not from the director yeah <laughs> Well, I mean, if the producer was alive, he would he would be adding to it. If the head of the studio, Terry, wasn't ill, then maybe he would lend a voice. The, the, the problem is that there is no one there who was emotionally attached to it. I'm not sure anybody at the studio wants to feel connected to it. Uh, it's not going to do them any good. Um, I think if the audience grew and made a demand for it, which is what I think happened with the Zack Snyder, the Snyder uh, mm -hmm. thing, because there was a lot of controversy, as you probably know, around the, yeah. you know, the original cut. Uh, then, then maybe it would happen. But, but uh, I, uh, powerless because I do not own what I've directed, um, uh, which is a sad thing, but true of most of my colleagues. <laughs> That's how it works here. Um, there you go. Uh, so I, I think... It would be fun, great, and really, really imaginative to do. But how you do it is anybody's guess. I think it's from the audience. Okay. Now, we are a spy movie podcast, and you know, you do the Avengers, and then you start a very rich TV career, and you've done episodes of Chuck, as well as Burn Notice. I was just curious, maybe what lessons you took from Avengers in terms of spy storytelling? Well... That's another good question. Um, I, I happen to really, really love that genre, starting with the spy who came in from the cold and, you know, and, and moving right through the Cold War, Ipcress Files, and then I could just name a whole litany of it. We have a project, uh, me and my partner, uh, Harley Payton, we have a company called The Modern Story Company. We're developing several uh shows and one of them is entitled uh, breach it's it's a amalgam of a cold war spy thriller and the magicians so oh, okay. it's a, it's it's a kind of supernatural within the cold war uh circa you know 1960 something mm -hmm. so um it's something that i love uh harlot's ghost i had for a long time trying to uh get that made rights issues all the way down the line uh, with the family. Uh, it's something that I've always wanted to do. I love kind of classic spy thrillers and I like non-classic spy thrillers. So it is a genre, um, you know, the, there's been a lot of really interesting TV along that line. I mean, the Germans have done one, the tunnel is interesting. I mean, you know, we can talk endlessly about that as a genre. Did I take something from it? No, I don't think so, because I think all human storytelling is really, you know, it gets down to on the performance level, there's a negotiation. And on the emotional level, uh, there's also a negotiation. So as long as everything settles in a foundation of emotional reality, you can apply whatever genres to help you. Uh, with the intention and expectation of the audience. Because once they uh, uh, understand the genre, that's why they're watching it, it kind of creates a less or a more narrow path for them to enjoy it. They don't have to look outside of it. And when you punch those walls, they're always surprises. Right. Um, so I, I don't see any genre as a thing in and of itself. I do think that what makes genre 
interesting are its limitations. And so spy genre, no different. Well, seeing as we're heading down this this path now with the spy genre, whenever we have a guest on, we like to ask a couple of questions about their their favorites of the spy genre. The Americans. Um, okay. Okay. Um, well, we'll go. Is that your favorite spy story of all time? No, of all time. I don't think I have a of all time because there's it's hard to compare the Americans with. Uh, the, you know, the Ipcrest Files. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. By the way, the Ipcrest Files was very influential on the Avengers. Interesting. You know Go what on. I mean? Those kind of shots and the boldness of it. And, the you know, so anyway, just so you know, I watched that a lot before I did that. Um, is the 39 Steps a spy movie? Definitely. Absolutely. We've covered uh, it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, th- there's, you know, you take, you know, again, I guess... I guess Hitchcock would would have to be at number one, you know, um, running from that plane in the field, uh, you know, it's just as great today as it ever was and amazing. And uh, so I I put him as my favorite, Uh, but then you get into all of these great English directors who really knew how to do it. the Americans a little more broadly. I mean, you know, you could talk about, you know, what's a great spy thriller, uh, American circa, you know, late sixties, early seventies. Um, oh God. Um, but yeah, uh, what's the name? Uh, you know, um, Warren Beatty. Right. Uh, what was that called? He's a parallax view. Parallax view. Thank you. Yeah, Thank no you. <laughs> Ed- edit that pause. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, Parallax, you, th- those are like, I love those things too. Um, so you could probably go through every decade and see a, a different version of a spy mm-hmm. show. And, and now with, with television, there, there's more. I think Joel Fields, who I know very well, and, and we, we did the power, the nuclear power show uh, together. Uh, he was uncredited, but wrote the script. And, and you know, he, I thought the Americans was really dazzling, really, really a great approach, um, you know, to, to, to kind of contemporary spy um, sensibility, even though it was right. set in period. Um, nowadays, everything is so messed up that I think it would be very difficult to do a, a, a contemporary modern day spy thriller because you know, if you set it in North Korea, maybe. Mm, right. You know, the, an interesting show that I dipped my toe into. Uh, I don't know if, if you'd consider it a spy thriller comedy, but it's certainly it's called um, Crash Landing on You. OK. Obscure uh, about a uh, South Korean think of her as a Kardashian, right? Uh, to the manner born, uh, goes para- paragliding, parasailing, and is blown into North Korea, where she basically falls in love with a North Korean soldier who is determined to protect her. Hmm. It's just nuts, you know? That's a version of it, because they, they're looking for an Ameri- uh, you know, a South Korean spy who they think is infiltrated. Um, you know. So that counts. I'd say that definitely counts as a spy story. Yeah. Um, pivoting off then, if we're speaking maybe not as serious as a, as a normal spy thriller, perhaps a Bond, James Bond. Mm. Do you have a favorite Bond film? Doctor No. Yes. Very nice. Can't Sorry. Hey, hey, it's fine. The DNA. I mean, yes. Thunderball for its extreme, uh, you know, yes, Goldfinger, because it was so sexy. Yes, Daniel Craig, because it was so modern. Um, But Doctor No. I mean, and maybe I say this because it's one of the very first movies that my father took me to. And I was like, if this is the movies, I'm in. (laughs) There so, must have been something very delightful too about casting James Bond as the villain in Avengers. It was not only it was, was it, it that, but I remember for for Rafe's birthday, I had I filmed it, and I had Sean uh, going, 
Bond, James Bond, and <gasps> happy birthday, Ray. You know, like, because wow. this is not a man who does that willingly, right? Right. But, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? He's, he's put that away. Um, but yeah, um, I think that that's the DNA of sort of modern spy movie making. That was great. And he had a lot of great stories about it, too. I remember. It's, it's really interesting learning that uh, if it wasn't going to be James Bond, it was going to be Harry Palmer. Mm. That's true. That's why when we were walking up and I said, you know, if you're out, I'm just going to send the script to Michael Caine. <laughs> I, I knew that would dig it in, right? <laughs> and you know, they're very good friends. In fact, um, yeah. I remember we had a dinner with Michael Caine and me and Sean. I forget who else was there, but that was pretty wow. That was great fun. I think I, mean, I would just I need a beat just to realize where I am and just. Oh, yeah. I was like that, even though I, you know, obviously knew them. Yeah, it just shows that regardless of the outcome of the movie, the experience sounds unbelievable. The experience was fantastic. And and yeah. so you can't you can't begrudge that because that's part of your life story, right? It's just part of the ups and downs of doing it. I'm lucky I have had to have a job. I've been working as a, a creative for a long, long time. I'm still a practicing artist with a, you know, I think a pretty active um life and sales and all of that. I have a website that people actually go to and look at, uh, you know, and, and see my work, other work than, than my uh, directing work. Um, so, I, you know, I consider myself pretty lucky. I'm, you know, living in this nuclear power plant, as you can see. Of course. Oh, uh, you know, living here in Venice is, it's, it's, it's good. I mean, it's good today, that's for sure. You know, in California, we're doing a little bit better than we were in January. So, mm. so it's a strange time that we that we live in currently. But, good time uh, for podcasting, right? Definitely. Well, definitely. Yeah. Hey, you want to guess? They're available. <laughs> They're at home. They're not doing anything. That's yeah. right. It's all good. Yeah. Well, I, I, the last question I always ask, I think you've answered it. Um, is, is Sean Connery your bond? He's my bond. He's my Bond. There's no hesitation. He's Bond. No, That's why Dr. No. 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 He, he's the DNA of it. He he encapsulated it. He got it. You know? I'm not arguing with that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd love to see Idris Elba play Bond, to be honest. I think that would be fucking brilliant. Mm-hmm. It, it, I'm very excited to see where they go next with it. Do you, apart from Idris Elba, do you have any other pitches? Uh, for, for the character? Mm-hmm. Anything uh, really? I mean, the the other interesting approach is to give it to a woman, mm-hmm. and 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 just have her called James Bond, not Jane Bond. Like just that's her her nom de plume. I think that would be an interesting approach if you want to keep it alive. Um, you know. On the other hand. There is an argument to be made not to be PC about it, not to set it. Like if I was in charge of the franchise, I think what I would do is I'd go back to the early 60s and I would make it in period with all of the un-PC, all of the, like to encapsulate that vibe and do it in a way so we can see how far we've come from it and yet enjoy it for what it is historically because i think that would be interesting that's uh that's full fleming full yeah. fleming that's what i would do and i've read i read the books too you know i read those books and and his story is amazing as well you know fleming story that people have tried to to tell somewhat ineffectively but but i think um I think there's a, there's an interesting story there, but um, yeah, I'd go back to the '60s and do it that way, and not try to be modern about it, because I think that's where they live. It's a, you know what I mean, and and there, there's so much there's so much about trying to um, judge the past by the culture of the present. Mm-hmm. 
that I think we, we need to really understand the context of the past so we can understand the behaviors. It's why Mad Men was so successful, right? Right, yeah. It was unapologetically of the period. And so we, we were allowed to cringe, right? Yeah. That It gave us permission to cringe and go, wow, that's really bad behavior from these guys. But we could see it. And, and I think it, rather than going, no, it was great then, it was perfect. Um, so may, maybe that's, that's a way to do it, not to be apologetic about it, but to understand that we have moved past it so we can see the entertainment, but we can comment socially and still have our cake and eat it too. I mean, I could be wrong. And that's why they're not asking me <laughs> to take <laughs> over the Bond franchise in any way. But, but we are, so... That's, that's good. That, yeah. That's a start. There's two. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I suppose I want to thank you for taking the time to talk about this film. Because I know, as you said, it has a, a trauma for you in a way, but it was also a great experience in making it. And I know reliving these sorts of things can be problematic. So I really want to thank you for taking the time to, to talk to us about this film, because it's an important film to both of us. We both, as part of our upbringing in terms of spy stories, it's the films that we saw in the cinema. Yep. And it, it's, it's great to speak to you about it. Yeah, and it's funny because, you know, I showed it to all my Brit friends when I, the first cut you know, mm -hmm. with a temp score and whatnot. Everyone like just loved it. Oh, I loved it. You know, so I was very excited about it until I got back and, and ran into the bus saw there. But, um, you know, uh, the trauma of it all, the, you know, I, you know, I've gotten over it and, and, you know, trauma for a creative white male, mm. I mean, geez, who am I fooling? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it's terrible, <laughs> you know. Um, no, I've been very fortunate, and you know, you've got ups and downs. You learn from it, but again, it's your life. You move on. So I, I'd be. I've got uh, one second, Cam. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. You reminded me to to ask Jeremiah. Uh, one of the listeners uh, and uh, has been on the show asked me to ask you about the score, the Michael Kamen original score. Is that is that vaulted away now? Never going to see the light of day. No, it's since he's passed on, you know, it's mm -hmm. hard to kind of pull that stuff up. And I, it was just before I would be smart enough or capable enough of pulling all that stuff into a computer. You know, we, we didn't have fast enough, big enough drives and all of that to have a, a piece of it. But it was very dark. And that's what I loved about it. And I loved Michael. He was amazing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just before we sign off, is there anything you're working on right now you'd like to tell the audience about or anything thing you know uh, online uh there's a couple of things that i cannot talk about since they are unannounced uh but you know one is uh i mean there are two tv shows that we are producing um at the we're at the casting stages of one and the writing stages of the other um you know we have different kinds of properties of which i mentioned one uh, about the breach which we haven't set up yet um, we are, I mean, I, you know, I go to my website, chechik.com. You can see the still work or animated work that I've been working on. You can find me on foundation, you know, uh, if you are into spending some dough on some digital art, NFTs, etc. you know, pitching, writing, reading, casting, you know, it's been quite a pandemic. <laughs> uh, you know been here in the uh in the control room for you know 14 months 15 months looking forward to maybe stepping out um uh, with my baby toe first <laughs> it seems like the safest place to be right now in the bunker here yeah yeah, yeah. okay well, thanks guys thank no, you thank you, you so you much this is great okay pleasure and uh see you when it comes out okay. i'll be chasing you down <laughs> <laughs> you edited all my best stuff out it's just us talking for 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs> that's it <laughs> bye guys you. have a good night thank, thank you very you. much bye. i did not think i would come out of an interview about the avengers appreciating the film more but i did appreciating or understanding more <laughs> that's a fair point that's a fair point i think appreciating the promise it had mm. 
appreciating what could have been. And, uh, you know, if you can, because I can now view the film at a different angle and see where the good film is inside of the film. You know, now knowing that all of this fun stuff was just stripped out of the film. And, you know, me and you have problems with it when we spoke about it a couple of days ago. It's a problematic film. People did not like it at the time. Jeremiah even acknowledges the fact, you know, his first line speaking to us, he, you know, he talks about the derision of the film. Mm-hmm. He derides it himself. You know, right. he, he understands how it's viewed. Um, but speaking to him has allowed me to sort of see past what was presented to me to the potential underneath. And I think it's very clear. And I, I feel like I recognize this even at the time seeing it in theaters back in 1998, that it's been edited to ribbons. Like, it's very rare for a filmmaker to craft a film that is so clearly choppy. You know what I mean? Like, it, it, you can tell that the studio scissors were really taken to this movie. Um, so to me, this was much more of a really interesting breakdown as to what happened. Because clearly, this wasn't, you know, the vision of the film going in. There was a lot of ideas behind, you know, what this was going to be. Jeremiah talks about his you know, two hour version of the film and that it delivered an experience he was quite happy with and that, you know, the ultimate product was not at all, you know, delivering what it was supposed to. So to me, it's always interesting to hear a filmmaker talk about that process of how something like that happens and just sort of that death of a thousand cuts that can happen when there's a lot of studio interference and a lot of studio um, apprehension about a, you know, project. And it's, it's, it's somewhat heartbreaking in a way to to just think about, you know, something you've invested you know, two years or so of your life in. And just because some guy in an office somewhere decided that yeah. he's just going to, to, to ruin your work. And if anything, he's more or less, and I, I don't often swear, but I'm, yeah, I'll swear for this. He's pissing his own company's money up the wall by ruining the film. Whoever made the decision to chop those, you know, 20, 30 minutes out of Avengers cost them the film because it ruined it. And also, you know, word of mouth hit the film. There was embargo for reviews and that just kind of compounded on it. And it made it less, it's like Razzie nominated film that it was. But it's also the classic victim of a studio shakeup in terms of leadership This is the most common story you hear whenever there's these movies that come out that people throw up their hands and go, what was going on with that one? So often it's the case where there's been a shakeup. The new boss has come in. He doesn't want the old boss to look good. So he's going to mangle those final big projects because you don't want to look um, like the guy who's following up the really successful guy. You know what I mean? It's like you want to be the one. Look this was disasters coming out of the previous regime. I'm here to really turn the boat around here. And it's a common Hollywood story. And it was really interesting to hear Jeremiah talk about it just from the point of view of someone very much going through that process. It's kind of interesting in a sense that I know somewhere the full length version of the film exists in some vault, in some salt mine somewhere, maybe on crate. I don't know. And I don't think I'll ever see the light of day, but I can guarantee that was a better film. Yeah, it'll probably never see the lighter day. I agree. Um, Yeah, I would say that even if someone doesn't like the two hour cut of the movie, um, you know, maybe they don't connect with the energy it's bringing. It's certainly going to be more cohesive. You're not going to be confused by what's going on moment to moment. Um, it, It whereas with the finished version that we have this 80 like 89 minute version of the story. It it really is frustrating to watch because characters are clearly, you know, teleporting all over the place because the connective tissue has all been cut out. Like those issues would not exist in the longer cut. Absolutely. And yeah, on a lighter note, he was telling us stories about working with Sean, stuff like that. I mean, that story about being in the pub and the guy comes up for the autograph and then wants Eddie Izzard's autograph instead. Yeah, and Sean's just sat there. I mean, that I, I'd love to have been a fly on the wall just to see Sean's face when the guy just completely blanked Sean Connery. I was honestly 
stunned when he told us about how pleasant the whole shooting experience was, that the production was a really pleasant one where they all got along. They were all on the same page. That is going into covering this film this week. That is not what I expected to discover at all. I genuinely expected to hear a lot of studio oversight during production, a lot of notes being given back and forth, where it feels like a lot of the major issues happened after the production, which I really just did not anticipate. I think in the episode, we talked about our issues with like the dialogue and the exchanges between characters. And you generally tend to find out when you look into it, that it, those things stem from a you know, bad chemistry or you know, like a fraught atmosphere on the set. And it just seems like that wasn't the case. And so, Again, I'm not pointing fingers, but I, I think I know where the blame for this film sits. Uh, I still think that the finished product is a mess. Mm-hmm. Um, quite rightfully so. But I can also, I can almost divorce Jeremiah from it in a sense. That wasn't the film he delivered. That's like the, the edited down version you see on a plane. Yeah. And I mean, there are so many movies that people don't like in any given year. The fact that people are still talking about this film, you know, this film version of the Avengers um, this many years later shows that there's a spark of something that they recognize as being worthy of discussion and analysis. Um, You know, it's in some ways become a cult film on its own merits, even in this compromised, you know, final cut. Um, there's a lot of podcasts that talk about this movie and just how strange it is. And you get the sense from, you know, Jeremiah that it had a unique quirky tone and whether, you know, the two hour version would have grabbed everyone. I don't know, but it feels like too specific a vision to forget. Like there's a lot of, I'm sure if you look up the year 1998, there's like some generic, terrible action movie that the whole world has forgotten. Um, the Avengers, people are still talking about it. So it shows that it hit a nerve in some ways. I think also, just from being on this side of the pond, The Avengers was a big TV show here. Mm-hmm. I don't know about its success in the States or, or North America, but you know there was palpable excitement for this film. I remember seeing the trailer. I said this to Jeremiah. I remember seeing the trailer and being genuinely excited. I would guess in around the year 97, I would have been 10. It sounds like the perfect film for a 10 year old to watch, you know, that sort of action comedy spy film it looks great. And then I remember just being completely dumbfounded in the cinema. And that was one of my first cinematic experiences of thinking this isn't good. Yeah. Um, so that was a lesson for young Scott, but I think overall just, uh, and you know, we spoke about some other stuff too, but this week we're focusing on the Avengers and I, I really wanted to, try and get to grips as to why we got this film. And yeah, we have a second interview coming up in a couple of days time, which we'll introduce, which we'll intro in a minute. But I was, I was almost relieved to know that the team behind this film wanted the best for it. It wasn't like it was given to a bad director and it was bungled. Mm-hmm. I think, I think everything that the team that was working on the film did was great. I think it just had problems in the edit. And that's why we ended up with this mess. Yeah, um, it's going to be interesting talking to, you know, Don McPherson about writing this film, because I think, you know, anyone listening to this interview should really, I really recommend checking out both, because I think what Jeremiah talked about was much more in terms of studio politics, in terms of post-production, how the movie wound up the way it did. Whereas Don McPherson's going to break it down much more on a story level. What was the story? What got changed? What point did it get changed? Um, there's a ton in terms of the original villain, the original um, vision of what the movie was from a um, you know central focus. Um, so there's a lot there that is going to come up in the future. But from Jeremiah, it was just a fascinating glimpse at sort of behind the scenes when you are the director of a big, you know, in this case, summer blockbuster gone awry. I just found it fascinating and. I gained a lot of respect just for him talking about um, his background as a photographer and his, you know, love of experimental art. Like these aren't things I necessarily knew about him going in. You know, you look at movies like Benny and June, um, even Diabolique, which he briefly touched on. um, 
they don't feel like films you would see leading into the Avengers. So I found just his artistic journey really interesting. So there you have it, folks. That was uh, part one of our anniversary special talking about 1998's Avengers with, of course, the director of the film, Jeremiah Chechik. Thank you for checking out the episode. Um, We've queued it up already, but Cam, what have we got coming up in two days' time? Yes, we are going to have the second part of our Spy Master interviews series on the Avengers with Don McPherson, the screenwriter behind the Avengers. Yeah, it's a it's a really fascinating chat about sort of you'd think we do it the other way around because it's like a baton pass between the two. The the screenwriter creates the story and then he hands it off to the director who creates the film. But I think the story of how Avengers ended up the way it was hinges on Jeremiah. And so I'm glad we did that first. And to pivot into Don, I think, uh, is really interesting. So we've got some great stuff with Don. And that's coming out in two days' time on Saturday. But don't forget to follow us discreetly on social media, at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, good luck in the winter of our discontent.